My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us, and I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expected a happy and gay welcome to behold on the contrary, tears and wretchedness? William is dead. That sweet child, whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay. Victor, he is murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May 7th, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Palais. The evening was warm and serene, and we prolonged our walk farther than usual. It was already dusk before we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. Ernest came and said that they had been playing together, that William had run away to hide himself and did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him with torches, for I could not rest when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself and was exposed to all the damps and dews of night. About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy, whom the night before I had seen blooming and active in health, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderer's finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home, and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. She was very earnest to see the corpse. Entering the room where it lay, she hastily examined the neck of the victim and, clasping her hands, exclaimed, O oh God, I have murdered my darling infant. She told me that that same evening William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. This picture is gone, and was doubtless the temptation which urged the murderer to the deed. Come, dearest Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. She weeps continually and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death, her words pierce my heart. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein. My dear Frankenstein, are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened? I can offer you no consolation, my friend. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? to go instantly to Geneva. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. During this short voyage, I saw the lightnings play on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly. I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced, the heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops. But its violence quickly increased. William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature 
and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. Could he be the murderer of my brother? He was the murderer. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent of Mont Salev. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. Two years had now nearly elapsed since the night on which he first received life. And was this his first crime? Alas, I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch whose delight was in carnage and misery. The remainder of the night I spent, cold and wet, in the open air. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind, and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I hastened to my father's house. My first thought was to discover what I knew of the murderer and cause instant pursuit to be made. But I paused when I reflected on the story that I had to tell. I remembered also the nervous fever with which I had been seized just at the time that I dated my creation, and which would give an air of delirium to a tale otherwise so utterly improbable. Besides, of what use would be pursuit? Who could arrest a creature capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Salev? These reflections determined me, and I resolved to remain silent. Welcome, my dearest Victor. I wish you had come three months ago, and then you would have found us all joyous and delighted. But we are now unhappy, and I am afraid tears instead of smiles will be your welcome. Do not welcome me thus. Try to be more calm, that I may not be absolutely miserable the moment I enter my father's house after so long an absence. How is my poor Elizabeth? She indeed requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of our brother, and that made her very wretched. But since the murderer has been discovered, the murderer discovered? Good God, how can that be? Indeed, who would credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could all at once become so extremely wicked? Justine Moritz! He related that the morning on which the murder of poor William had been discovered, Justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed, and after several days one of the servants had discovered in her pocket the picture of my mother, which had been judged to be the temptation of the murderer. I was firmly convinced in my own mind that Justine, and indeed every human being, was guiltless of this murder. I had no fear, therefore, that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward strong enough to convict her.